the difference engine. Babbage's analytical engine, the best engineering analysis that have been published is it probably could return. It's just too many gears, too many trains, too many cams and levers and widgets. It's just not physically possible to operate. So, so it's a steampunk computer. It's a steampunk computer. So we wanted we wanted a computer that we could actually build in the 17th century. And use. Okay, and use. We wanted to be able to build four function calculators because abacus assistances are cool, but they're hard to learn and they're a pain. Um, and I'm lazy. How many of you know what the Kawanda effect is? Oh, there's a few of you. Cool. Well, I've been cool. here. Cool, we've searched so, before. <laughs> yeah, right. The Kawanda effect is this really neat idea that when you have a stream of anything, it attaches itself to a surface. Y'all have stuck your finger under a running faucet and noticed how the stream of water hung onto your finger and displaced off to the side, right? Everybody's seen that. So. That's the Kawanda effect. The stream will cling to a surface, okay? So if you have an input, a power stream like this, and you have a disturbance in the power stream, you can move the cling from one wall to the other with a little input. So you can move it from here to here. Now, yes, what, happens, do that. <laughs> what happens if you have a divider there? Now, I can direct this one way, and I can direct that another way from a control source, can't I? I have, an, I have a toggle switch that's operated by a control source. I've got a binary switch, right? Effectively a fluidic transistor. A, effectively a fluidic transistor. So here at the bottom, we have the divider, right? With the power stream and no input, the output goes that way. With the power stream and an unbalanced input, it gets diverted this way, and then and it changes and it clings here. The Kawanda effect says it stays. I don't have to leave that on. You just have to push it once. And I have to push it once and it stays. So I have a flip flop in one part. With no moving. With no well, yeah, I've got the, moving. I've just got the moving the fluid. The water stream. Right. right, but I've got no valve. There's no mechanical. There's components. no mechanical component. I have no valve, so I have a flip flop that operates from steam, air, water, whatever you want to pump through it. Okay. All we need is a computer key. Now all we need is a computer key because three flip flops makes an adder. Now you would think that this would be a little abstruse for a small town in West Virginia, but. About 10% of all of the water meters out in front of your house work that in way. North America are Kawanda effect water meters. Yeah. Because the at the, the, the bluff body, the, the, the thing in the center, at the bluff body there is a pressure change when it flops. And a very, very, very simple pressure indicator can be used to count that. Tick, tick, and tick, tick. it just so happens that the uh, the frequency of the flops is directly proportional to the flow of the fluid. Right. So it's a real easy water meter and a lot of people use uh, it. Part of the reason, when I wrote 1632, part of the reason I chose a town like Mannington, it's a very working class, blue collar kind of town with relatively small number of college graduates in it. But this kind of knowledge is a very, very Basic. Basic right. and widespread in, in that kind of town. Whereas if I take it Evanston, Illinois, <laughs> about half population with the college professors, they would have been able to explain this theory a lot better. I don't think they would have survived more than about six months. I don't think so. <laughs> so that's generous. So, that's generous. <laughs> Speaking as a college professor. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so um, it's so, all right. You, you see how I can make a computer with no valves, nothing not that's a, going to move I'm except my fluid, time. right? Okay. Um, if you if you if you Google fluidic computers sometime, you'll discover that people have built hobbyist systems with up to uh, 30, 40 gates, and they work just fine. Okay. Hmm. Um, in the 60s, Bendix came up with the incredible idea that they could use this to control machine tools because it was hydraulic and it was all neat. But the problem was, of course, by that time in our world, 
electronics was already well developed, right? And so to compete with electronics, they had to make their systems very, very small. Okay? Min with channels that were on the order of less than a 64th of an inch. Okay? What's it take to plug a channel that size? Anything. Everything. Yeah, right. <laughs> Every, literally nothing. Turns out that the ability of the oil to accidentally take some humidity out of the air was enough to froth it enough to stop them from working. And so every every fluidic Bendix controlled lathe in the country in the world got it ripped out and replaced with a piece of electronics. But they do work. So in 1632, we upsized the channel, right, to make it a reliable thing. Um, and we also take advantage of the fact that they're making bleach and we run bleach water through it. And so we put a filter. And um, we put a filter in place. Well, well, they're not competing with jillions of integrated right. circuits being you know, produced in time. Exactly. The other thing is the, you see the, the, the uh, ones on the bistable or two-state device pictures there? Those could act, those can actually be cast ceramic. Which is where I was just, yeah, thanks, Walt. That's exactly right. So imagine this. Well, I thought it up, so I can it. Is. It's extremely cool. So imagine this. Lay out your circuit with, notice that these are two-dimensional, right? Just like integrated circuits are two-dimensional. They exist in a plane. I'm not going to say the L word. You can do that. No. <laughs> these are two-dimensional. So. Roll out a piece of clay. Make a mold that's the size and shape of your flip-flop. Punch it into the clay. Make the channel to the next place. Punch it into the clay. Make the channel to the next place. Or better, lay out your entire circuit all at once. Put it on a press and go, Nick, with a release agent. I admit, this is fussy work. But trust me, artisans are capable of fussy work. But you do that, you fire it carefully so that you get the right shrinkage, you let it dry carefully, and you'll have a lot of rejects, just like Intel does, you know? Intel has a lot of, of plates that they image that they throw away. And so, but the point is, we can take an entire circuit. All at once. All at once, stamp it into a piece of clay, dry and it, fire it. Bake right? it. Right, bake it, and then we can take the next piece of circuitry with a vertical connection, right? Hook, cover that bottom layer with a bit of wax, stack the next layer on top of it so the vertical connections line up, and the next one, and the next one for however complex a circuit you need, and then we put a plate across the top, okay? <coughs> so with that, using channels between an eighth and a quarter of an inch in size for the, for the fluid channels, I can put a four function calculator in one cubic foot. Box. Huh? Put it in a box. Put it in a box. So a stack of clay plates, one cubic foot. The other thing you can do is you can cast each one of those things using slip. Yep. Um, and when you do, you get a thing that's about three quarters of an inch by an inch and a half by about a quarter inch high. Um, and you can put little holes in the bottoms of them and put little studs on the top of them. And porcelain doesn't and react so to heat make the same way. Lego way. electronic circuits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And let's that was the L word he didn't want me to mention. <laughs> and, and let's say that all of this is really pie in the sky and it's only 4% is efficient, so 27. So now it's a cubic yard. It still changes everything. It yep. still changes yeah. everything. And so and, and, and this we, is something we that absolutely positively know that the material to do it is in Grantville. Because we've looked in the Mannington Public Library. We know the material is there. We know that the logic diagrams for 4004 and 8008 circuits, our processors are in the Mannington Public Library. We know they're there, 100% certain. So can this be done? Yes. So that's cool so far, right? Um, and so we call that the aqualator. <laughs> Okay. I, I read, yeah. I, I, well, as you know, I'm an ignorant. What is four function calculation? 
plus minus, at plus minus multiplied by i. I'll even give you a it's, square root yeah. t. It's you know, seventh you grade math. Right. Okay. Okay. How many places? You could have just how said, many places? Yeah. You could have just said basic math, but instead you had to make it four hundred. <laughs> <laughs> high school teacher. <laughs> It I, was, I last taught physics in high school in 1983. <laughs> it never wears off. Um, go ahead. All right, never mind, keep going. Next okay. Is 404. Okay, a 404 was the first general purpose microprocessor, and 8008 is the first one that ran the CPM operating system. This is a real computer. Okay, which one? The 8080. The 8080. 8080. Oh, no, no, no. You can run CPM on an 8008. And 8080 is an upstep from that. Trust me. But the, but the, the first software is in Mannington too. The software is in yes, Mannington too. Absolutely. Although this would be different software because we're not going to copy the circuit exactly. But give me a minute. Yes. But our one cubic yard CPU includes about five, about six or eight k of RAM. Okay. Now that's a lot of RAM. I know, I know, your laptop has gigabytes of RAM now. I don't care, 4 or 8K is a lot of RAM, okay? How my much Apple did my Apple II that I bought in 1977 and the Space Shuttle used 16, 32 k Yeah, my, my <laughs> first computer that I programmed and IBM 1130 programmed with cards with a line printer that had a wheel at every position on 132 spaces and they went and went clunk. That had 1K of transistor memory. Every bit was an individual transistor. Oh my God. The, re the Apollo spacecraft had 5K around. Exactly. So don't discount this. This is a very real machine. The yeah. reason I asked about places is the one cubic feet compares fairly well to this ancient mechanical the calculator <laughs> that I used right. at MIT at one right. point. Sure. They had it in one of the labs and right. I just had to use it. Right. I, it was probably half a cubic, but obviously right. it went out to a lot more places than a slide rule right. did, but not a huge right. number. Uh, this would be your typical calculator level of precision in 10 or 12 decimal places. Now, displays. Well, displays. For a calculator, displays are simple because I only have to give you numbers, right? And so I literally could give you, you know, just pop outs so in I'll each look. place that, um, well, I could do seven, seven, eight segment pieces, but I could just give you zero through nine with a pop out where you read the ones that were sticking out. I mean, I don't care. Four function calculators are easy, right? And when we get into CPUs, what are you gonna use for a display? Well, there are a lot of ways we can do displays. They're gonna be low resolution. They're gonna be character oriented because that's the way computing was until the 1980s. And trust me, we ran a lot of computer programs before that. We did. But, so mm -hmm. they're going to be low resolution, character oriented displays, right? But, but, but that's not weird enough, really. I mean, I've got water powered computers made out of clay, molded <laughs> and stacked with wax, and their keyboards, of course, are organ keyboards, right? Right, because we have because organs. I've got valves attached to each key, so the keyboards are organ keyboards. And there's plenty of downtime. There's, there's plenty of organs. organs. 